Thank you all for joining. My name is Anthony Schmidt. I lead R&D at Arima Genomics. And today I'll be talking about leveraging the 3D genome um, and 3D genomics in general for structural variant detection and gene regulation analysis, really as a, a technology update, I think from us, but also hopefully as a helpful introduction to um, the uh, presentation we'll hear from Dr. Chavez uh, after my presentation. So I'm gonna go off a of video just to help with my bandwidth uh, <clears throat> here, and then we'll continue. Great. Um, so here's just an outline of uh, the presentation. Really the first half of this is gonna be introductory in uh, nature, a, little, a bit of background on 3D genomics and how that can reveal novel biology, um, some background on structural variants with respect to disease, and also some information on our, on our new product offerings that we're gonna be um, announcing today, which is res with respect to FFPE sample type en enablement um, for our uh, IC technology, as well as a bioinformatics pipeline, which, which we're calling the ARIMA SV bioinformatics pipeline. And then in the second half, we'll go through um, quite a bit of uh, uh, data and examples of um, how this technology can be used to detect gene fusions or uh, non-coding structural variants and how to link those uh, structural variants uh, to their impact on gene regulation. All right, so let's, so, so let's get started uh, with this first section here. When, when I think of you know, uh, traditional uh, genomics, I think of sort of the linear genome, the three billion base pairs that when you stretch it out linearly is about three, um, uh, I'm sorry, six uh, feet tall. And it can be uh, represented as this sort of strings of A's, T's, C's, and G's. And to contrast that to you know, 3D genomics, um, 3D genomics is really the ability to measure the three-dimensional structure of the genome across many different hierarchical layers of that genome organization. So what's shown here is a schematic of the three-dimensional uh, structure of the genome. And what's also really powerful about 3D genomics is when you measure the 3D genome via sequencing, um, not only do you get the structure of the genome, but you also get the underlying sequence information because you're using sequencing as the sort of readout to measure the structure. So we refer to this as sequence and structure um, as, as the uh, characteristics of 3D genomics. Now, the as I said before, the uh, 3D genome is organized into hierarchical layers of genome organization. So I'm gonna move through this from left to right. At this first leftmost um, image, what we're looking at is the entire genome, really just a model of genome organization. And some of the features that stand out, which of course have been known before, is that uh, chromosomes organize themselves into uh, chromosome uh, uh, territories within the interphase nucleus. So these different chromosomes are colored, for example, pink. And this one seems to occupy this space here, whereas the one that's dark blue occupies this space uh, here. And this has been seen from imaging studies um, before. And as you zoom in, let's say, to the next hierarchical layer of a genome organization, there's these other properties, such as um, certain parts of the uh, chromosome tending to um, organize itself against the nuclear lamina, other parts of the chromosome extending more towards the nuclear interior, and this uh, concept of uh, compartmentalization, which is really just a set of genomic regions that tend to in interact with each other. So in that example I gave where there's many different regions from different chromosomes that tend to all organize in the center of the nucleus, those might be all considered compartment A, and then all the loci that interact Sort of more towards the periphery of the nucleus might be compartment um, B, and this also relates to uh, gene, gene control, which we'll talk about on the next slide. So moving from compartmentalization more towards the right, and as you zoom in sort of on the megabase scale, what we're looking at over here is self-interacting topological domains. So that's what's depicted here is really self-interacting uh, chromatin regions which are then demarcated by architectural proteins that sort of serve as boundaries between this topological domain and, and this self-interacting topological domain. And then another architectural protein here and so forth. Okay. 
And then lastly, as you zoom in within a topological domain, as shown here, there are these uh, looping interactions, which are depicted here, which are held together also by uh, protein factors such as uh, cohesin and mediator. And these types of interactions can also bring together cis regulatory elements such as promoters and enhancers to facilitate gene expression. So with an understanding of these different hierarchical layers, you know, how do they impact, or, you know, sort of what's their uh, biological relevance uh, and what's their, um, what, what are the pathological implications when, when these processes go awry? I don't have time to go into this in detail. There's a nice review here cited um, from the uh, Duan lab. But if you look at these three key architectural features of the genome, of the uh, 3D genome, I should say, some of the biological relevance of these different features include promoter enhancer communication. The 3D genome also helps um, pair transcription with uh, splicing. Um, these higher order um, uh, chromatin interactions also coordinate gene expression and have a role in uh, DNA repair and replication timing. So of course, when these systems go awry, they can have uh, pathological implications such as the long range effects of uh, single nucleotide variants such as uh, GWAS variants or the genesis of oncogenic fusion transcripts or chromosomal translocations. And just to go through maybe one path here to give sort of a, an example is these loops that I showed you on the last slide that <clears throat> facilitate uh, gene, gene regulation through promoter enhancer communication. It's actually helpful for interpreting the long range effect of GWAS SNPs. So the vast majority of these GWAS SNPs that are, that are coming out of these studies uh, fall in non-coding in non regions and can, infect, can affect enhancer elements, which, which ultimately help you know, govern gene expression. And the thought is that if you know the crosstalk between enhancers and promoters, you can then uh, link the effect of the SNP on a given enhancer to its target gene, which may be involved in the pathogenesis of a particular uh, disease or phenotype. Moreover, with uh, compart compartmentalization, that's really the concept of coordinated gene expression between multiple uh, uh, loci in the genome. And it turns out that past studies have shown that the three-dimensional structure of the genome and the, and the loci that tend to interact within that three-dimensional space influences the uh, formation of uh, chromosomal translocations. So when you have recurrent uh, chromosom uh, chromosomal translocations in, in uh, sarcomas, for example, um, the genesis of those can be influenced by the three-dimensional organization of the genome and, and which, uh, which uh, loci tend to interact. So with that being said, um, Arima High C is really a tool to measure the three-dimensional organization of the genome using sequencing. And what's shown here is a four-step uh, workflow, starting with sample prep on the left. So this would be the high c sample prep. After sample prep, the uh, DNA goes into Illumina library prep, followed by Illumina sequencing, and then data analysis. And really, the key benefits of the ARIMA high c workflow is flexible sample input requirements. So we have validated protocols for blood, uh, tissue, cell lines, and I'll be talking more about the FFPE sample type later on. This is fully integrated with standard Illumina library prep and it's a, and it's a user friendly workflow. And really the applications of the ARIMA high c workflow are as follows. There's uh, genome assembly, which I'm not gonna talk about today. And there's also epigenetics, but just studying the uh, relationship between uh, genome organization and function. And then what I'll be talking about more so today is the application of 3D genomics and high C technology specifically with respect to human health. And that's understanding disease mechanisms, developing therapeutic approaches and structural variant detection and the role that structural variants play in uh, disease. And before I uh, talk a little bit more about structural variants, I just wanted to highlight the ARIMA technology platform. And I've been talking a lot about 
Arima High C, which is really the core technology platform, um, which is a robust uh, a tool really to be used across all of those applications that I mentioned before. But I wanted to make maybe the, the distinction that the Arima High C technology platform has four uh, uh, different uh, capabilities. There's genome-wide high C, which is really the genome-wide surveillance of 3D genome structure and measuring the 3D genome unbiasedly sort of genome-wide. And then there's different targeted versions um, of high C where you detect uh, 3D interactions that are associated with specific uh, chromatin proteins, which is really kind of like the uh, combination of high C plus chip seek into a single assay. So you get all of those three dimensional interactions that were associated with a particular protein factor. So that's one form of, of a, a targeted 3D genome analysis that we offer. And then there's uh, capture high C. And that is also a, a targeted version of high C very much like exome sequencing or gene panel sequencing is to uh, traditional genomics, um, here we're applying that probe capture enrichment approach to a high C library instead of a traditional DNA sequencing library to really enrich for interactions that are associated with specific sequence elements like promoters or really anything, um, <clears throat> anything that makes sense for your particular research question, which we call custom capture. So that could be capturing a contiguous locus around a gene of interest um, a set of promoters that are particularly interesting for stem cell biology or oncology or neurobiology it has that flexibility um, to look at the 3D genome for really any region of interest. Okay, so with that introduction on the 3D genome and uh, the HiC tool, let's talk a little bit about structural variants of disease. And I think since we're all joining this you know, webinar, um, this information is probably not particularly new, but of course there's a wealth of structural variants <coughs> that are present in a typical human genome and structural variants are known to cause a range of diseases, including cancer, which we'll be talking about uh, today. About 95% or more of cancers have at least one or more uh, structural variant according to a recent publication. And by, um, you know, I think historically lots of structural variant analyses have focused on gene fusions, uh, which we will be talking about quite a bit today, but it's also important to appreciate that structural variants um, can also impact the regulation of cancer genes through three-dimensional interactions, right? So this requires really an integrative approach to understand the role of structural variants in disease, whether it's a gene fusion or a non-coding rearrangement. And we'll be talking about that um, at length uh, in the second half of this. So to sort of map the structural variation discovery, validation, and then functional analysis pipeline across this three-step continuum, um, on the far left, structural variant identification has really been, been driven by lots of tools. I think um, from whole genome sequencing, RNA sequencing, um, optical mapping, uh, FISH, and now um, IC, which is what we'll be focusing on uh, today and some of its capabilities and advantages. And, what, and once you have identified those structural variants, they can be you know, subsequently validated by tools such as PCR and Sanger sequencing, immunohistochemistry, other types of uh, targeted NGS, so not necessarily a comprehensive list. And then once they're validated, it's really important, I think, to take that one step further and uh, look at some of the functional analyses like what are the gene fusions that are created, uh, which you can do by, by high C, which is why that's highlighted in, in, in blue, and I'll be showing examples of that, but also what type of gene regulation disruptions uh, occurred because of a particular structural variant? How did it affect the, the uh, regulatory landscapes of uh, topological domains, enhancers, and promoter enhancer communication? Now, as we think about high C as a tool to identify these structural variants. Let's go back to one of the first slides that I showed here where we depict traditional genomics like whole genome sequencing or gene panel sequencing 
as a linear string of A's, T's, C's, and G's. Now let's consider a uh, interchromosomal translocation between chromosome four and chromosome uh, six. Traditional short read sequencing approaches, whether it's WGS or gene panel, really relies on coverage across the breakpoint. Molecules that get sequenced that are chimeric and have that breakpoint junction. So if you were to just pile up reads across this, this region, you might only have one read or effectively one data point in your, in your data set that contains information about this particular rearrangement or a uh, translocation, I should say. Right, so there's relatively few reads that span the breakpoint. And conceptually, the advantage with 3D genomics, such as high C plus, plus sequencing, is when you have the same uh, translocated chromosomes four and six that are fused together, which often happens in cancer, all of these interactions that are occurring on this rearranged chromosome provides actually many, many, many more data points and signal, if you will, to be able to identify this uh, translocation. So high c is really measuring the structure of uh, chromosomes in situ within cells. And because translocations perturb the structure of those uh, chromosomes, really by measuring the structure, you therefore can find the translocations with improved uh, sensitivity. So if I depict all the molecules that are a result of these interactions, you can see some of these interactions are just within chromosome four. So that might be the purple only molecule. Some of them are within chromosome six, and those are the, the blue only molecules. Then you have lots of interactions that hop over this breakpoint. So those are called breakpoint crossing um, reads, which are the signal that you'll see really allows you to detect these types of uh, translocations using uh, high C plus sequencing. Now I'm not gonna go through this paper in detail, but I, I really just wanted to point to it as one of the pioneering papers. This is from uh, Fang Wei and Jesse Dixon and a whole host of others <coughs> um, that was published uh, in Nature Genetics a few years ago that really um, pioneered one of the first algorithms to detect structural variants in cancer genomes using high c there, there are other tools out there from um, uh, Peter Fraser's group, uh, Peter uh, Park, Derhade. Um, but this one was particularly motivating, I think, uh, for us during our technology development because of the high accuracy it has in, de in detecting interchromosomal translocations, but also large intrachromosomal rearrangements, uh, such as deletions, inversions, and tandem duplications. And as described in this, in this paper, when you look at some of the uh, functionalities of HI-C as, as a tool to identify structural variants of cancer genomes, you can look at uh, functionalities like what's the resolution that you have uh, for pinpointing the breakpoint of a structural variant. And um, the algorithm that was uh, published in the previous paper, which is ultimately incorporated into our ARENA SV pipeline, is able to pinpoint that breakpoint to about 1 kb resolution, which is it tries to predict the breakpoint with about 1 kb precision around the true breakpoint. And I included here uh, one base pair resolution just because that there's emerging tools that try to take that one step further, which is using the high C signal to approximate the breakpoint, and then going back to the actual read, read level data and looking for chimeric reads in the, in the uh, sequence level data to try to pinpoint the breakpoint at one base pair resolution. So there's a tool from Peter Park's lab that, um, that uh, works on that. Also, you can think about, can you detect uh, structural variants in regions of low mappability one of the nice advantages of high C is that when you have a breakpoint that's located within a repeat region, that would be inaccessible to traditional short read sequencing approaches because you have all these long range interactions that happen across the repeat or over the repeat, you're still able to sort of have that signal in the data to be able to detect a structural variant, even when the breakpoint is located in a region that is of a low sequence complexity. However, it cannot detect a structural variant if the entire structural variant is contained within a repeat sequence. So if there was an inversion that was fully contained within a, within a repeat sequence, it wouldn't be able to see that. Okay. 
Um, another important parameter here when it comes to the functionality of high c as a tool to identify structural variance is the size or the type of the variance um, that it can detect. So I'll, I'll show some examples of being able to detect these global chromosomal alterations like reciprocal translocations between uh, two different chromosomes. And it also has the ability to detect large deletions, tandem duplications, and inversions. And the, the um, algorithm is really designed and optimized to detect um, these types of events as long as they're larger than a megabase, but you can certainly appreciate smaller events um, as well when you, when you look at the high C data. And uh, lastly, the, function, the functionality of being able to um, detect complex SVs. And the point that I wanted to make here is you have, if you have a complex SV that's really the concatenarization of four different uh, chromosomes together, all of those regions that form that complex SV are now going to be in close spatial proximity to each other and detectable by high C. And it enables you to link multiple SVs together that are part of a more complex SV. Right. And our, our goal here really was to integrate all of this capability into our bioinformatics uh, uh, solution. Second, let's, let's talk about the challenge of FFPE samples. This is, this is probably pretty well known. FFPE tissues uh, really represent the most common and ubiquitous um, biospecimen uh, type in, in, in oncology. And it's the most common method for preserving uh, tissue morphology in uh, clinical samples, typically for some sort of histology uh, type of analysis. Um, but in, importantly, these FFPE samples usually perform quite poorly for most molecular assays. So it's very hard to extract, I would say impossible to extract high molecular weight DNA for um, structural variation detection, whether it be for long read sequencing or some other long range type of approach like optical mapping that really depends on the ability to extract high molecular weight DNA. And second, RNA degradation um, from these um, archived and harshly treated samples hinders the ability to detect fusion transcripts. So, so those are some of the challenges that are present in high C samples. And despite these challenges, our goal is really to unlock access to this type of critical um, sample type given uh, the mass amounts of biospecimens and potential sort of genomic secrets that could be unlocked if we were able to profile structural variants gene fusions and do gene regulatory analysis in this sample type. Um, so with that, I mean, I'm extremely excited to really announce this early access to some of these new uh, capabilities and products um, that we're gonna be talking about. So what is new, right? If you look at this high C workflow, what's new is the following. So let me actually first start with what's what's not new. Um, originally, the ARIMA high c uh, technology was able to analyze blood samples, cell lines, and frozen tissues. One of the things that is new is the ARIMA SV pipeline. So if you have cancer samples, whether they're cell lines, frozens, or uh, liquid tumors, you can use the new ARIMA SV pipeline to profile structural variants and uh, DNA uh, loops. The second thing that's new is enabling FFPE samples with the new ARIMA IC FFPE product. So this um, assay as well as the existing assay can both be combined with the new ARIMA SV pipeline to detect structural variants. So let's go through each of those. First, the ARIMA IC plus FFPE sample uh, preparation kit. Really, you know, like I said before, to utilize FFP samples to discover, discover structural variants associated with disease. Easy, easy to use workflow, and you can go from sample to discovery quickly and easily. Shown here on the left is really four key points of that workflow, starting with FFP samples, whether it be one to 10 five micron sections that are uh, typical section thickness for pathology lab cuts, you then go through the ARIMA high c 
sample prep, sequencing, and then data analysis using the REMAS pipeline. I'm really <coughs> excited to talk about this. This is the REMA SV pipeline. Um, you start with your FASTQ files here from your Illumina sequencing of your ARIMA high C libraries. <coughs> Contained in here are four tools that make up the ARIMA SV pipeline. Not going to go into all the tools specifically, <coughs> but more talk about the outputs. So this pipeline outputs structural variant calls, chromatin looping calls. It also outputs uh, a high C heat map that can be uploaded into a desktop software called Juicebox. And importantly, that heat map allows you to visualize the high C data interactively, and then you can very easily layer on the loop calls and the structural variant calls on top of that high C heat map to integratively look at gene regulation and structural variants in a single desktop software interface. And again, that's called Juicebox. But it would also be compatible with, a, with other high C browsers um, and also high C data QC statistics. And importantly, all of this is contained within a Docker image. Um, this is the first time that we've uh, contained one of our tools within a Docker image. I think this is really exciting because you only have to install one thing. Um, you don't have to worry about, worry about dependencies and all the complexities with installation. You just run a single containerized pipeline. Um, this is also uh, portable, so it can be incorporated into other pipelines. Like if you have a structural variant pipeline that currently uses whole genome sequencing and optical mapping, this single uh, Docker image can be incorporated into other pipelines. It can also be scaled, so it can be transferred to the cloud um, to be scaled up as needed, and it can be standardized in an execution environment such that it can be run on university uh, servers, AWS, Azure, et cetera, all the different cloud uh, platforms. We really tried to make this easy to use. And then uh, lastly, I think I already talked about this, but really the key benefits here is expanding the detection of uh, structural variants by enabling FFP samples, um, detecting these structural variants with a simple, easy to use integrated bioinformatics pipeline, and then linking these structural variants to their impact on gene regulation. All right, now we'll go through some, some of the data and examples. So shown here on the left is a really a karyotypically normal uh, sample and a genome-wide high C heat map. And what you're looking at here, all this red signal is high C signal, and it's really a, a measurement of spatial proximity. So the darker the red signal, the more spatially proximal any two regions are on the genome. So if you had a high C interaction that you detected from sequencing between chromosome one and four, it would end up as a little red dot here. And if you had an interaction between chromosome four and chromosome four, it would end up as a little red dot <coughs> um, here. So um, the thing that really stands out is that the vast majority of this high C signal is intrachromosomal. So chromosomes tend to interact with themselves. Um, and that's been known for a long time. And that's what has been seen with other types of studies and models of the 3D genome organization is chromosomes occupy themselves in uh, territories and are highly interactive with themselves and less interactive with each other, as you can see here in the, in the uh, 3D model of genome organization. However, in an abnormal karyotype situation, this happens to be a uh, colorectal cancer sample that has a chromosome uh, four, six translocation that forms a ROS1 gene fusion. Um, you see this really strong um, in, intra-chromosomal interaction signal strength, but between two different chromosomes, because really you're, you're capturing this high interaction signal on a fused chromosome within cells. So it really comes off as this really high interaction strength, but between two different chromosomes, and it really sticks out like a sore thumb. And this is the type of information that the algorithms harvest to try to find these structural variants in the genome. And the way to interpret these um, is 
uh, if you zoom in right locally around this ROS1 SLC 34A2 fusion, how do you tell that this high C pattern is telling you that there is a gene fusion? So I'm gonna show uh, many plots that are like this. Um, so I wanna walk through this one slowly and then I'll go through all the others quickly. When you zoom in, you'll have a gene uh, here on the left. This is on chromosome six. It's transcribed from five prime to three prime. So that's the orientation of the gene. Here's the gene on uh, chromosome four from five prime to three prime. And there's this very distinct kind of bow tie or uh, butterfly pattern that you see in this high C, high C data. And that, and that actually tells you where the breakpoints are. And I'll, I'll explain how we uh, get to that. So these uh, purple lines that I show here are the breakpoints that would be inferred from the high C data. So let's, let's go through that. Is if I just ignore this for now and focus on the strong pattern that's down here in the lower right quadrant, what this really means is that there's a really high degree of spatial proximity between the five prime end of ROS1 and the three prime end of SLC34A2. There's not spatial proximity between the three prime end of SLC34A2 and the three prime end of ROS1 because this is essentially devoid of signal. So this high degree of spatial proximity means that those two parts of uh, ROS1 and SLC34A2 are fused together. So they're actually really close together along the linear genome on the rearranged chromosome. And you can infer that the structure of this particular gene fusion is therefore the five prime of ROS1 and then right at that break point, it keeps going with the three prime end of SLC34A2. And here's all that high C signal that hops over that break point that gives you this high degree of spatial proximity between the five prime side of ROS1 and the three prime side of SLC34A2. Okay. This particular example is actually interesting because there's also a really high degree of uh, high C signal between the five prime of SLC34A2 and the three prime of ROS1. So this is a classic example of a reciprocal translocation where the two chromosomes essentially broke and then swapped uh, places and then recombined. So that's what is being uh, de depicted um, um, here, right? So this is really an example that hopefully steps through how to interpret the high C signal to actually tell the five prime and the three prime partners of a particular gene fusion. And we have now uh, validated this workflow across many different clinical samples in collaboration with three major research institutes, 24 total FFP samples across 19 different tumor types, one to 12 years of FFPE archival period and about 300 nanograms of DNA going into, into each of our different um, high C preps. Very briefly, I just wanna talk about this uh, quality control metric that we always look at in high C, which is really what percent of the data are these long range interactions. And of course you wanna have lots of these because really the long range interactions is what's being harvested to not only detect the structural variants, but also the gene regulatory loops. And in a typical frozen sample, um, that value is typically around 40%. And from FFPE samples, we're still getting about 25 to 40% of all of those reads being long range interactions that are useful to detect stru uh, structural variants as well as gene, gene regulatory analyses. If you look across the list then of all the gene fusions that we detected in these uh, 24 samples, there's a list here. I'm not gonna go through them all, but maybe just highlight one or two examples because I'm also running out of time. Um, but what, what we did was we compared uh, our technology to, and, and, and its, a, its ability to detect all of these uh, gene fusions that were previously identified using uh, targeted DNA sequencing fish or targeted RNA sequencing. And what we found over here on the right is that we could detect all of these using high C or 100% concordance with these gold standard methods. And now I'm just gonna talk through uh, a few examples. Um, the first one that I wanna talk through is, is uh, focused on NTREC fusions. And I think what's interesting here is this is a case of a fibrosarcoma. Um, when you look at 
the uh, chromosome 12, 15 interaction space, which is this little sort of blip down here, and you zoom into that whole chromosome, um, what you're seeing here is the chromosome 12 by 15 interaction space. And you see this really, really strong intrachromosomal like signal, but it's happening between two different chromosomes. And it has that same butterfly pattern that I showed you before with the uh, ROS1 fusion. And there's a tiny little black dot here, which you'll see in a second, which is the algorithmic call of the gene fusion. So let's zoom into that tiny little algorithmic call right there at the, at the breakpoint. Zoom in. Here's the NTREC gene over here. Here's the ETB6 gene over here. This is the uh, breakpoint. <coughs> here are the algorithmic calls from the high C break binder pipeline placed right here. And from this, of course, you can tell that this is an ETB6 from the 5 prime end, NTREC3 on the 3 prime end gene fusion. This one also has to be, or also happens to be reciprocal in that you have the other uh, type of event where NTREC3 is the five prime partner and ETV6 is the three prime partner. I think what's interesting about these NTREC fusions is, of course, not only are they found across different uh, cancer types, but they can also be formed by simple reciprocal uh, translocations such as this or more complex rearrangements. So here's a Here's a breast tumor that also has an NTREC3 fusion. When you zoom into that space, there's this, there's really a sort of shattering of chromosome 12 and chromosome 15, and it's shattered and recombined with a couple dozen uh, breakpoints um, in the first maybe 20 megabases of chromosome 12 and the last about uh, 20 megabases of chromosome 15. However, this shattering also when you zoom in, has produced the same type of ETV6 NTREC3 fusion that you see also in the more simple case. Okay. Um, I'm going to actually skip some of these examples that we have in sarcomas because I want to um, <coughs> pass things off to Lucas. Um, the last thing I wanted to show is not just interchromosomal rearrangements, but also intrachromosomal rearrangements. So ALK uh, tends to rearrange with a gene called EML4 in non-small cell lung cancer. And when you zoom into that uh, chromosome two, you can see these tiny little red blips in the high Z heat map and the black boxes around those structural variant calls uh, reflected on the lower left of the matrix. So you can see the call here and then the unperturbed signal appear on the right. And you can, Zoom into those as well and also learn something about the structure of the gene fusion. Here is an example of the five prime side of EML4 and the three prime end of, of, of ALK. So this is a EML4 ALK fusion in non-small cell lung cancer. And uh, lastly, uh, what I'm gonna leave with is really this idea that we've been talking a lot about gene fusions. Um, so you have this case where gene, let's say B from uh, chromosome B fuses with gene A from uh, chromosome A. And it's not just necessarily the gene fusion that can be important, but it's also the three-dimensional interactions that happen around the gene fusion that play a role in the regulation of oncogene expression. So what I've tried to translate here is a gene fusion, but also the fact that cis regulatory elements that could live on one side or the other of that gene fusion can now access uh, genes in ways that they couldn't access before without the gene fusion. So this can happen in this type of a model, or you can have intergenic breakpoints and genes near those intergenic breakpoints, uh, as shown here, that can also be hijacked by cis regulatory elements and drive oncogenic gene expression. Um, I have an example here, but I guess I think in the interest of time, I want to pass it off to uh, Lucas, because um, I think he's going to show some nice examples of this as well. And hopefully I've introduced the concept um, and then he can also show some data on this. So uh, lastly, in, in conclusion, structural variants are critically important for understanding human diseases such as cancer. And we really believe that 3D genome analysis has the ability to improve structural variant detection 
while also really simultaneously providing these functional insights onto gene regulation. And just to reiterate some of the new solutions that we're launching into early access today is enabling FFPE biopsies to be analyzed with high C. Of course, this is in addition to cells, blood, and frozen tissues that are already available. Um, and the easy to use integrative and sensitive bioinformatics pipeline that's fully, fully contained into a Docker image that's hopefully easy to deploy um, on your informatics um, uh, platform. And lastly, uh, if you would like to join our early access program, it's open through January 14th. You'll receive a 25% discount on reagents or services and dedicated follow-up and support from Arima. And you can register your interest uh, here at this website, which we'll also show um, at the very end. Thanks a lot for your attention and I'll hand it back to Christian.